We're in trouble. Right now, at least in the United States, the COVID-19 pandemic is winning. It seems like there is a lack of leadership, there's no unified response on how we should act or what we should do and when and for how long. And leadership aside, I think there is a problem with the virus itself. It is almost perfectly evolved to take advantage of quirks in human psychology. I think COVID-19 is breaking our brains and therefore breaking down society and our everyday lives. So today I wanna to go through a number of quirks in human psychology that I think is letting the virus win. With the hopes of pointing these out, maybe we can come to recognize these quirks in ourselves and in society and maybe think twice about our actions, do something different, or at least be cognizant of where we're not being so cognizant. So the first aspect of the virus that breaks our brains is that it's an invisible threat. Anything that's invisible is harder to see by definition, but it makes it psychologically less salient. So if someone says, uh, alert, alert, a tiger has been released from the zoo. No, like a million tigers. That's an easy enough threat to see in your mind. You would see a tiger ambling down the street, all beautiful and striped and stuff, and you would know what to do immediately. You have some kind of experience, but for the virus, you can't see it. You can't see the particles when people cough or sneeze. You can't see their direct actions, and you are unable to really picture what a virus does in the human body. And because of that, you don't have an idea, a, a real feeling of the danger of something like this, these microscopic menaces. Secondly, humans are bad at dealing with threats that are slow moving. Like with climate change, something like a pandemic isn't a one day event, a one day disaster, and then we have to scramble to figure out what to do and come together and come up with a solution. No, this is many, many months or possibly even years in waves that we have to deal with COVID-19. And it's just hard to keep a threat in your mind for that long. You have some cognitive resources available to you and you have to decide where to spend them and you can get tired and you can get fatigued. You have disaster fatigue in particular and it's hard to keep up with the daily uh, reports of you know, disease and death and hardship and economic downturn and you can lose sight of what we're actually dealing with here. Thirdly, and a little bit more technically, our brains are insensitive to large numbers. So here's a thought experiment. Think of one dog accidentally having its tail stepped on. Oh, it's, it's awful, right? You feel like Snape in that one cutscene that everyone freaks out about, like, oh! Yes, yeah, so you can imagine and you can feel the emotion there. Now think of two dogs and that happens to them. That's still bad. Now think of 10 dogs. Something in my mind is, is, is ab abstracting the number of dogs and now I, I don't feel like it's so bad. Now how about 10 million dogs all having their paws stepped on? Now that's so big a number, I can't really conceptualize what that kind of harm would even look like and I'm less sensitive to it. There's a famous quote that a single death is a tragedy but a million deaths are just a statistic. Our brains are not sensitive to these large numbers even though from like a utilitarian perspective we should care more about a million people's health but we don't. We care more about the single story, the single emotion, the single uh, tug on the heartstrings but we don't. COVID-19 thrives on large numbers. When we think of 120,000 people dying in the United States, it just feels not as bad, as bad as that is to say. It doesn't feel as bad as 10 people dying in some kind of uh, you know, car accident on the way home from soccer practice. Yeah, me just saying that sounded terrible. And when you abstract it to, you know, people died like they died for the flu, but even worse, you're like, eh. You see, that's your brain. That's your brain not working with the scale of the problem here. And compounding this problem with large numbers, our brains are insensitive to small percentages. We like and we are more intuitive to, you know, 75% or 90%. It's harder to conceive of 1% of something and what that really means. Now, when you combine that with large numbers, we get even more insensitive. So say if COVID-19 affects, you know, say everyone in the United States got the virus, 300 million people. That doesn't even make sense in my mind. We're not equipped evolutionarily to think of what 300 million would even look like. Now I say, but only 1% of those people will die. Like, oh, 
Well, now that doesn't sound that bad, but 1% of 300 million is still 3 million people, a catastrophe almost beyond any other that we've experienced in our human existence. So when you put the insensitivity to large numbers and the kind of incomprehensibility of small percentages in those large numbers, you get a, a lack of empathy towards what is actually happening, and that could cause you to, say, break lockdown or not wear a mask because... <sighs> And what's even more sinister about this virus, unlike other viruses, is that it goes against our intuitive health. So we have some intuition about how the world works. We have an intuitive physics. If I take this pen here, I intuit what will happen if I throw it up. It will come down. And we have some kind of intuitive health too. That is to say, we know what a cold feels like and we have an idea of how a cold will progress and stuff like that. For our intuitive health, I think most of us imagine that a virus is infectious when we feel sick and when we're sneezing and coughing and throwing up, et cetera, et cetera. But COVID-19 can spread asymptomatically. We're learning more about that. It may not be as bad asymptomatically as it is symptomatically, but it still does this. And this subverts our idea of our intuitive health. We can spread the disease even when we don't feel like we have it, or we can have it for a long period of time and never feel it and still be infectious. This helps the virus, and that's because our psychology isn't in tune with what our bodies actually do. And of course, there's a failure of memory here. A lot of people who are in the highest risk group, people are 60, 70, 80 years old, they might remember this, but a lot of people in the country, in the United States at least, don't remember how terrible measles was, or polio was. You, highly infectious, deadly diseases that we, uh, we eradicated, but the vaccines that eradicated them were victims of their own success. These vaccines work so well that it's been decades since people had a real face-to-face -face interaction with a pandemic. It's been too long, and now we feel like, oh, well, that kind of thing is never going to happen again, except it's happening right now, and again, we're insensitive to that fact. On top of all of this, in the United States, things are now political. And psychologically speaking, when you add a political tribal element to any question, even if it's scientific, you're gonna start to break people off into their groups and uh, confirmation bias will take over. They will uh, not listen to the CDC and only listen to what this thing or that outlet puts out because it reconfirms their beliefs. And politics is intertwined heavily with emotion. And we know from just studying human brains that when emotion is involved, it can override factual reasoning. And when you take all of this into consideration, you can see why if people are very emotional about wearing masks, for example, it could override someone saying, oh, but it will reduce infection rates by you know, 60% and literally save hundreds, if not thousands of lives over time and over the days and weeks and months and years to come, uh, maybe even more than that. It will take over from that. And that's really sad, but it's not surprising. And it doesn't help that wearing a mask is non-intuitive. I think we feel, again, with our intuitive health that's not very good, that a mask prevents you from sucking in bad air. That's the primate brain way of thinking about it. But I think this is a failure of communication on the CDC and the government's part. But now why you're supposed to wear a mask is to prevent you from passing on the disease to other people. Unless you're from a culture like Japan, this is opposite to what you expect a mask to do. So our medical professionals do need to wear masks that prevent ingress of air. That's why they're so much better than your bandana that you're wearing over your face that's probably from the Steelers and you don't cheer for them anymore and you put it over your face. That was too specific. It's to prevent you from spitting disease on other people and that doesn't really track with what our minds think they should be doing. And so you could see why people say, well, they don't even work anyway, and they don't even prevent you getting the disease, and so why should I wear one? Well, because it works the other... Oh, sorry, you went over... There are even more psychological pitfalls here. A problem with trying to correct someone's idea of what a mask should do runs into other psychological quirks like the backfire effect that we know from social psychology where if you try to persuade someone of an idea, they are more likely to believe that idea with less facts. That is to say, 
When you start piling on fact after fact after fact, trying to reason with someone, they will actually start to reject the idea, the more information, factual though it may be, that you give them. Yes, I know, it sounds crazy, but that's just how our brains work. The virus is taking advantage of us. Then there's the cost-benefit analysis that so many, at least Americans, have to deal with right now, where there is, on top of all of the pain and death and suffering, there's an economic cost. Tens of millions of people have lost their jobs in the United States, and they might have to think about putting their lives on the line, going on the front lines, being an essential worker, in order to you know, put food on the table. That's a terrible decision to have to make. And I don't think these people are stupid if you decide, well, you know, I have to risk it. I, it's, a, it's an incredibly hard decision to make, but it also makes following all the scientific guidelines even harder. The really disappointing thing is that we could be different creatures. We could have evolved in a different way to give ourselves different brains that didn't have all of these pitfalls that a virus could take advantage of. We could be really sensitive to large numbers. We could have evolved as social creatures to be extremely utilitarian, where if one person dies, we don't write a law in, in Congress and try to get it passed and have their name on the law. It's more like, well, if a million people die, then it's a serious problem. We could be creatures like that, but we're not. And that's why we need something like science and reason and insight into our own minds to objectively direct us towards the right actions. Right now, at least in the United States, that's not what's happening. We are running counter to the science. We are letting our psychologies get the best of us. You can see compilations of people screaming during town halls about not wanting to be, you know, muzzled dogs and they need their freedom, where you can see that if you were just thinking about the psychological quirks that you might have and how to correct for them, you might see your shift in moral reasoning. It, it could happen where all of a sudden, oh, I guess my mild inconvenience is worth literally saving some amount of life, some fraction of someone's life, statistically. I hope that we as a species can come together and acknowledge our psychological pitfalls and follow the best information that we can and, and really think about if, if all the statistics and all that is enough, think about the morality of the decisions that we're making. By not wearing a mask and refusing to do lockdown procedures, even though it might feel psychologically correct, it actually tangibly costs human life or at least human suffering. Know your mind, know the science. Maybe we can get out of this thing relatively unscathed, but right now, I'm not so sure. I hope this helps. Know your mind.